Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is April 9th, 2018, and we are doing something we've never done before, and we're super thrilled. Um, we are broadcasting to you live from New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, Yale University is right down the road. And we are here because we are here to interview again. We're bringing back to you uh, on Mormon Stories Podcast. We're bringing back to you Dr. Michael Coe. Um, many of you will remember many years ago, um, we interviewed uh, Dr. Michael Coe for Mormon Stories. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Coe is the Charles J. McCurdy Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at Yale University. Um, and he is the uh, Curator Emeritus of the Division of Anthropology at the school's Peabody Museum of Natural History. He's an expert on the Mayas, um, uh, who inhabited the same part of Mexico and Central America where Book of Mormon scholars say the evidence, the events of the Book of Mormon took place. So we interviewed uh, Dr. Ko back in 2011. Uh, it has been rated one of the top three Mormon Stories podcast episodes of all time. And that's saying something because we have now over 900 episodes of Mormon Stories podcasts. And this is one of the top three. And so many of you indicated that Dr. Ko's interview from back in the day was, was critical and essential to helping you understand uh, reality, understand the Book of Mormon, understand what it is, what it isn't, understand the church's claims about the Book of Mormon, etc. And so um, what we've thought about, you know, uh, on Mormon Stories is how do we do new things that add value? And one of the recommendations we received from many of our supporters was, why don't you bring back on people that you've interviewed in the past? Uh, we just recently brought back on Greg Prince. We brought back on Carolyn Pearson. And today we're bringing back Dr. Michael Coe. My, Dr. Michael Coe is 89 years old, and you would think that someone would slow down or maybe even dull a little bit when they reach the age of 89. Uh, not the case with Dr. Michael Coe. We have, uh, uh, my buddy Travis, if it's okay to say, my buddy Travis and I have spent a little bit of time with Dr. Coe this morning, and he's as sharp as ever. He's still doing research. He's still publishing books, uh, academic, scientific books, well into his uh, 80s. He's almost 90 years old. Um, and so we just want to welcome all of you uh, who are joining us today live on Facebook. We want to get your questions and comments. We're going to be covering a few topics. Um, some of you will know that recently, let's just say over the past 10 or 15 years, this new technology called LIDAR has uh, developed for uh, archaeologists. And basically, LIDAR I think it's these airplanes that fly by and shoot laser beams down and it allows them to create these sort of topological maps that allow them to understand uh, excavation sites or, you know, historic sites with much greater detail. And as National Geographic and other places have released LIDAR photos of, um, you know, Central American, Mesoamerican digs or geological sites, that sort of animated and excited many Mormons uh, around whether that sort of further proves the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon or not. So we're going to be talking to Dr. Coe about LIDAR. Uh, he, he knows a bit about it and has been working with it, and he can talk about to what extent LIDAR provides further proof that the Book of Mormon is true or not. Um, also, uh, within a certain amount of time after releasing our interview with Dr. Michael Coe, uh, Fair Mormon uh, released a response to my interview with Dr. Michael Coe. It has an introduction by Greg Smith, and then what it has is an open letter uh, by Dr. John Sorensen, um, basically responding to my interview with Dr. Michael Coe in detail. And so we are going to also be giving Dr. Coe a chance to help us understand John Sorensen's response uh, to uh, my interview with Dr. Coe. And so, and we'll also be taking questions from you, our listeners. I've pasted into my document several questions that many of you <laughs> provided ahead of time. And if some of you want to provide comments or questions as well uh, during this live interview, we welcome uh, your comments or questions. So uh, without any further ado, Dr. Michael Coe, 
Welcome back to Mormon Stories. It's a deep honor to have you here. Thank you for having me. Incidentally, I'm not quite as old as you said. I'll be 89 in one month. Oh, okay. <laughs> My apologies. Um, he's uh, 88 years old, not 89. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the clarification. <laughs> All right, Dr. Ko, well, welcome back. How have you been since our last interview, since since 2011? <laughs> Same as ever. <laughs> yeah? Just running along. Now, you know, a lot of people, when they retire, they kind of move to Florida and, and sunbathe and, you know, whatever, drive around in golf carts. I get a sense that's not what you're doing. You live like a block from Yale University. That's correct. I'm really fortunate to, 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 to have Yale there. I still use older facilities that I that I'm able to use and meet with the students and uh, listen to uh, lectures and stay up with what's going on. There's some wonderful students there now, uh, graduate students. Uh, I attend to their uh, uh, weekly lectures, which have been wonderful. No, I stay up with the field and uh, thank goodness for uh, the internet. I stay up with my colleagues all around the world. Uh, it's enabled me to, thank goodness, to uh, revise two of my books with new co-authors, and that's made all the difference. I've had them do all the work, and uh, it's been amazing what I've learned from them. LIDAR being one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that one of my co-authors brings that I've learned a lot from. So I stay up with things. So yeah, far, and, thank goodness. And as I understand it, you just published, uh, you're just finishing a couple books, is that right? Br bringing in new additions to old books. So what are the two books? Um, one of them is called Mexico. And uh, it's the f one of the first books I ever published with uh, uh, Thames and Hudson publishers in England uh, back when uh, they took a chance in asking me to write such a book. I thought I could write a book on uh, the Mexican part of Mesoamerica. And uh, I talked my way into that with, with the publishers. And uh, this is now going into its uh, eighth edition. Uh, uh, and I have now two co-authors who are helping me bring it up to date. The other one is one of my real uh, interests, uh, long-term interests, most well, people don't know that, uh, which is the uh, Khmer civilization of Cambodia, the people who are responsible for the famous Angkor and Angkor Wat. And I wrote a book about that, and that's going into its second edition, uh, in which uh, my co-author is one of the world's expert in the LIDAR technique of surveying. And this is going to be almost like a new book. And that is in the hands of the editors right now. And I expect it will be out, I hope, or we hope, by uh, next autumn, next fall. That's so great. So yeah. you're, you actually do research work with LIDAR. You don't, this isn't just something well, you casually uh, track. Well, I'll tell you, LIDAR is incredibly expensive to do. I mean, and uh, I haven't applied for uh, you know, funds to do my research for a long, long time. But my co-author, uh, uh, who's uh, been working with the uh, Sydney University of Sydney University in Australia, he's an Australian. Uh, he has managed to round up incredible amounts of financial backing uh, to to have this done, and it's it's been revolutionary. I mean what has been seen. Really, it's an entirely new world. So I haven't flown with those airplanes or drones or helicopters that have done that, but I'm profiting by it. Yeah, and, and the publishing you're doing uh, does does involve, you Abs know, Absolutely. LIDAR. I mean, uh, we're going to be publishing LIDAR images that have never been published of these uh, Cambodian sites and cities, and we had no idea even that they were cities. So um, we're learning a lot from them. And now it's uh, something spilled over into Mesoamerica, into, into Mexico and Central America, and uh, it's just starting there. 
uh, people are getting now wise to the idea that they really should be surveying some of these wild sites. And it's been very exciting to see what's come up. But that will be for my next edition of my Maya book. Yeah, so you're, you're going to keep going strong. All right, uh, Dr. Ko. So I think the best place for us to begin is to just talk about LIDAR. And if it's okay, I'm going to share um, from a blog called Book of Mormon Resources.blogspot.com. I'm going to share um, just sort of one of the articles that's been passed around right. and talk about what I perceive to be kind of the main arguments of the article and then maybe give you a chance to respond. Is okay. that okay? Okay. If, first, can you explain what LIDAR is to our listeners, just generally speaking, and why it's, it's helped with advancements in the field? LIDAR is uh, uh, really laser-assisted uh, surveying from the air, shooting hundreds of thousands, even millions of uh, laser beams from a, uh, an aircraft of some sort uh, either helicopter, which is what they've been using in Cambodia, or from uh, uh, actual light planes, or even from drones. And, uh, of course, what this does is, to uh, what the result is, is a topographical image of what's actually on the ground. It's used in areas that are heavily vegetated, like, for instance, the Maya area, which has got a tall tropical forest over a great deal of it, uh, or even scrub forests. And it works wonderfully uh, across the Pacific in Cambodia, which is also uh, a heavily vegetated area. So it shoots these beams down to the earth, and uh, most of them are going to bounce right back once they hit the leaves uh, of these trees and shrubs or what have you. And, but if you've walked in, a, in the densest forest and looked up, you can see that there are holes in the forest uh, where light does come through, open to the sky. Well, some of those LIDAR beams are not bounced back. They actually reach the surface of the ground through those breaks in, in, the, leaf, in the leaf cover. And they've got a computer program that can uh, take into consideration the leaf cover, those ones that are bounced back, and remove it. Uh, and uh, done in a, on a computer. So what you're left with once you've gotten rid of that vegetation uh, is digitally, is you're left with this amazing uh, three-dimensional looking map in black and white on the ground. And you can take and move the, the, the sun around even there uh, digitally to have it pick up shadows on one side or shadows on another side according to how much is shown by them. You can see all sorts of things, mound sites, uh, you can see living sites, you can see uh, fortifications, uh, you can see uh, dense cities spring up where nobody thought there was an urban population at all. This is particularly true in Cambodia with the great ancient city of Angkor. Nobody ever knew the amount of urbanization that was there until this happened. And, it's, let's say, and everybody says it's revolutionary. It's just something that you cannot do on the ground. You have to have uh, uh, do this from the air, and you can, for the first time, see what is actually there. All right. And so you're a fan of, of LiDAR and its uh, applications? I am a total fan of it, okay. actually. And uh, as I say, expensive though it may be, it's, it's also, you have to consider replacing, also expensive things to pay ground surveyors to go with their instruments overland, getting, you know, watching out for snakes getting eaten up by ticks and bugs and mosquitoes uh, who do this the old-fashioned way. Uh, and uh, now this new technique 
Uh, so it, it, it really is cost effective. You can get uh, almost instantaneously what it would take months and sometimes years to do if you were walking this stuff out on the ground. Beautiful. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, thank you for that introduction to LiDAR. We've got the thumbs up from Dr. Ko in terms of LiDAR as a technology. Now we're going to be discussing its application to Book of Mormon. Um, and specifically what I want to do right now is ask any of my listeners who feels bold and confident um, in their, you know, interest in these sorts of issues to consider sharing right now this interview live on their timeline. Because if, let's just say, you know, 100 of you uh, were able to share or 50 of you were able to share this interview, uh, the network effect of that sharing would be quite significant. And I know for many of you, because of the way Mormonism structured, many of you are petrified even to like, um, you know, the Mormon Stories podcast page or to like a comment or to make a comment. For those of you who it's not safe to, you know, let people know that you think about or learn about Book of Mormon archaeology, don't do anything. But for those of you who are confident and able, please do share right now this live uh, stream. And what you can say is, hey, we've got one of the world's experts in Mesoamerican archaeology who's going to be commenting on the truth, well, uh, on archaeological finds as it relates to the Book of Mormon. And hopefully a lot of friends and family and ward members will all be able to learn more uh, from an expert who has no real particular skin in the game. I think I think uh, a scientist is open to data wherever it comes from. So Dr. Ko is just kind enough to care about Mormons, to care about uh, us and our lives, and to help us understand what's true and what's not. Um, and that's kind of a way that I want to begin the framing of this interview, yeah. Dr. Ko. We're not asking you to argue with anyone. We're not asking you to even tell people what they should or shouldn't believe per se. I just want to say that the purpose of this interview, from my perspective, there are so many Mormons right now that are trying to decide what is true and accurate and what is not true and accurate um, because they are you know, asked to give 10% of their income for their whole lives to the church. They're asked to give two years of missionary service. They're asked to give five to 20 hours a week in their callings. Um, they're asked to give their name and their time and their reputation to the church. And you know, you know, many of the past prophets and even the current ones have said that the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon sort of is, you know, Mormonism is the keystone of the religion. The, the truthfulness of Mormonism rests on the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. And we're not even asking you to tell us your opinion about that per se, as much as it is, we've done this interview with you where you've given us your views on the historicity of the Book of Mormon. And then we get other, you know, from what we're to understand, very reputable archaeologists responding to you, sort of, you know, shooting down um, some of the things that, that we learn, or we learn about this LIDAR stuff and we hear apologists telling us that this is like proof that the Book of Mormon is true. And what we just want is your help in understanding what is sort of reliable science and what's not and how to make sense of the science. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. So, so we've got this article called Book of Mormon Resources.blogspot.com called LIDAR, uh, published February 2nd, 2018. We've posted a link to it in the show notes. And basically it says, hey, National Geographic broke this amazing story about the lost treasures of the Maya snake kings. And it shows all these Maya, uh, these LIDAR images of Central America, Mesoamerica, Guatemala, etc. And it says the details in the story, including those shared in the television special, explicitly corroborate dozens of verses in the Book of Mormon that describe dense populations, sophisticated economies, road networks, large-scale agriculture, intensive land use, disaster-prone landscapes, and prevalent warfare. Uh, this, this blog article says this is a paradigm-shifting event for LDS scholars who have tended to dismiss uh, Book of Mormon phrases such as the whole face of the land as hyperbole. If the Mayan lowlands were part of the Book of Mormon world as we believe they were, these grandiose descriptions are not far-fetched at all. Uh, respected archaeologists are now comparing the Maya uh, with the ancient Egyptians and Chinese. And so basically they're saying 
um, the Mayan civilization is far much more massive than we ever understood and that that makes the Book of Mormon even more true. So without asking you necessarily to opine on the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, do you have an initial response? We're going to go into the details of their argument. Do you have an initial response to sort of that setup in this blog article? Well, let's take the word city or urban, urban center. Uh, it is true that in Cambodia, in the Cambodian lowlands where Angkor is uh, on the other side of the Pacific, it's, it's been increasing the, uh, our knowledge of urbanization there without any question that uh, there are big cities with streets and avenues and that, that we never realized were there until uh, LIDAR came along. If you look at the uh, LIDAR that's been published so far, that's available of the, uh, these Maya cities, they're totally different. Uh, there, there aren't any streets or avenues. Uh, there are some roads or causeways connecting sites, uh, but as far as dense urbanization, uh, they're not. They're very scattered. The uh, these, these these sites. I mean, there's no overall planning. There's only one city in Mesoamerica that looks like an old world city, like the kind we would expect. Let's say in in Europe or China, and that's Teotihuacan, which is uh, up in the Valley of Mexico, way away from what the Book of Mormon is talking about. Uh, you're up in the, the area that was later, of course, controlled by the Aztecs. But Teotihuacan is fully urban. There's no question about it. We knew that before LIDAR was invented. I mean, okay. uh, th there's nothing like this in the Maya area. They're very dispersed settlements. And uh, to call them cities, you know, they had the, the probably the power structure in there, religious structure. Uh, royal structures, but, you know, once you take a look at this, it's, it's very loosely organized, and even with the best LIDAR uh, images, uh, there isn't any fence urbanization going on. Maybe, maybe let me back up and just ask you, did, have any of the LIDAR images that you've reviewed in Mesoamerica made you more interested in the Book of Mormon as a historical document? <laughs> do I think, let's put it another way, do I think that any of the images that I have viewed back up uh, claims about the Nephites? And the answer is no. No. Uh, no, I've never seen anything that, that really pertains to what we're being told in the Book of Mormon about big, high cities with dense occupation. Okay. They never had that. I mean, you, you take Tikal, which is the, uh, one of the really largest cities. It wasn't part of the famous Snake Kingdom, but they were a rival. Uh, and it's been, uh, we had the LIDAR images now for it, and we had a very good mapping of it. it it's, uh, there's no way that this compares with the old world cities. Uh, if you compare it to the city that I know, Angkor, Cambodia, archaeologically, uh, it's, it's, it's a shrimp. It, it doesn't amount to a pile of beans. No right-thinking Cambodian would look at it and think it was a city. Nor would a Roman. I mean, uh, they're, they're very lightly occupied. And the entire population of, <clears throat> say, Tikal, uh, uh, you couldn't imagine that there's more than, at the most, maybe 90,000 people living there at its height. Whereas uh, an old world city in China, for instance, a contemporary one in China, or, or in Cambodia, uh, at Angkor, you're talking about cities that had 750,000 to a million people. That's totally different. Uh, so the old uh, sort of Zarahemla territory did not have urbanization of this sort. LIDAR has not shown that. It's been extremely interesting. We found things there in the Maya area. Uh, I showed you some this morning on my computer where an amazing batch of fortifications has shown up uh, 
from the, the period about AD 200 to, to 400. But that was a response to the Teotihuacan invasion of the Maya area. They took the whole area over. And Maya cities don't look like that. Okay. To call them cities is, is an exaggeration. Okay, so, you know, one of the points they make is uh, 65,000 previously unknown structures speaks of large cities and villages in all quarters of the land. Basically, that's from Mosiah chapter 27, verse 6. So he's basically yeah. saying the Book of Mormon in 1830 basically claimed that there were large cities and villages in all quarters of the land and that, that the LIDAR now yeah, backs right. that up. And your view on that piece is not so much. Well, if you look at that big LIDAR survey, that's now just beginning to be studied and published. I showed you part of that this morning uh, on my, my uh, desktop. Uh, once you move away from, let's say, Tikal West, you get, you know, maybe a couple of people here, family there, you know, it sort of peters out. Uh, you can survey yourself. So you're walking the whole area that was covered in jungle and so that jungle didn't exist. And uh, uh, it's actually, it, it doesn't show this enormous population at all. Let me ask you just it like... Change, it doesn't change our ideas that we've had all along about uh, dense populations or lack of them. Okay. Let's just say, let's just say Joseph Smith, when he uh, authored the Book of Mormon or when he produced the Book of Mormon, would have made these sorts of claims that there were cities and civilizations and roads. What keeps you in your mind from saying, whoa, he must have been a prophet if he could foresee, you know, the book must be an ancient record because it's foreseeing roads and, and buildings and cities and civilizations way back in the 1830s. Does that just in and of itself speak to the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon or Joseph Smith as a prophet to you? It speaks a lot about Joseph Smith. I mean, he had a wonderful imagination. And there's no question about it. And he, you know, and he, he was raised on the Bible, which talks about these things, the Old Testament. Uh, uh, so if I were Joseph Smith in those days, I would think the Bible was the truth and to, to, to base yourself on. I mean, after all, this came from a, the Bible was written by people who were urbanized uh, early on in the Near East and the Old Testament. And uh, they just transferred that, I think, by wishful thinking to these uh, so-called Nephite cities. So he over-urbanized his... He over-urbanized Over the, uh, the yeah. Native Americans yeah. by projecting what he knew about the ancient world yeah. into Mesoamerica. The, the only, as I say, there's only one area in Mesoamerica uh, not far from Mexico City, which was fully urbanized. It looks a lot like a, a Near Eastern, ancient Near Eastern city, and that's Teotihuacan, which has been fully mapped now. And uh, uh, But there was never anything like it, either before or since. And uh, even though they took over the Maya area, they didn't transfer their urban ideas, you know, with, Streets and avenues laid out on a grid, uh, nodal points, uh, clear-cut marketplaces. Uh, even the Teotihuacan overlords who took the Maya area over, let's say, in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, they could never make the Maya want to live in a place like that. And they never did. Does, do, do the LIDAR sort of images around Teotihuacan make you more inclined to think the Book of Mormon might be a historical record or Joseph Smith well, I, was a To tell you the truth, I don't know that they've ever done light on Okay, well, the, the discoverment... Account. I'm of sure this, they're going to do it, but... Right, but of the cities, the, the discovery of these vast cities, does that make you think about Book of Mormon archaeology or historicity? Well, if, if, if Joseph Smith had talked about the Valley of Mexico... Uh, as it was, uh, let's say, between 200, the Valley of Mexico was the valley surrounded by volcanoes where you find modern Mexico City. Modern Mexico City is built on the old Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, which was fully urbanized on that island, 
had streets and avenues and a dense population. Uh, and uh, its predecessor, Teotihuacan, there's no question it's one of the great cities, it's the greatest city in the New World. Uh, but he didn't know about Teotihuacan, and he was looking to the area that his hero, uh, um, John Lloyd Stevens, who discovered, uh, these, according to Smith, these Nephi cities, i.e. Maya cities, uh, that the, the, you know, those people did not have big cities. Uh, in the sense that we're thinking about. Uh, if he confined him, his ideas of, oh, in the central Mexico is where they were, then there might be something in it. But he's in the wrong area. Okay. Um, is there anything that Joseph Smith of the Book of Mormon revealed about Mesoamerica in, in 1830 that wouldn't have been generally perceived or known about or understood? In other words, had... Mesoamerica been explored, and was there a general understanding about what Mesoamerica was like, and even some of the ruins that might yeah. have been there? Well, as I say, uh, the, this American diplomat, Stevens, and his uh, English uh, sidekick, this artist, Frederick Catherwood, uh, until they went to the Maya area, nobody knew anything about it. Basically, there was nothing scientifically known uh, about those things. And of course, when their books were first published uh, uh, in, in American and England, Smith had those. I mean, you know, he was talking to that. And uh, the, uh, but archaeologically, we knew nothing about it. Nobody had ever dug these sites, had no idea what their dates were, who lived there. Stevens, however, very definitely in several places said these. These cities that we've discovered, he called them cities, but uh, were made by the ancestors of the people we see around us, the Maya, and not by any other people. And he was refuting ideas that, you know, these, uh, that were all over the place in those days, especially in the U.S., eastern U.S., that uh, you know, white people had come from, uh, from the old world somewhere uh, from Europe or the Middle East, come over and say built the mounds in the Midwest. All the scribes, the Welshmen, the Phoenicians, anybody but the actual Indians who lived there. And Stevens was refuting that idea. So there was an idea book. going around in the eight, early 1800s that white people, that there were white Native Americans. Very definitely there were ideas about that. So Joseph didn't, yeah. so Joseph could have gotten his idea about oh, Nephi. Oh, he certainly did. I mean, it was part of the of the, the mindset of those days, looking down on the native peoples as degraded examples who never could have built, let's say, the great mountain groups that we know were at one point were all over the Midwestern United States and southeastern United States. Uh, they'd look and say, well, that this grunting Indian he could never possibly, his ancestors, have built this stuff. That was big stuff in those days. Many books, not just the Mormons, or Book of Mormon, but many, there was in, in the air that white Americans could not believe that dark-skinned Americans could do anything like this. And, but Stevens did not. Stevens didn't follow that mindset. He refused to believe it. That's nice. So Joseph Smith would have heard about the reports or the maps of Stevens's expeditions, he would have known oh, there yes. were temples oh, yeah. and ruins, and that would have made him have the idea that, that yeah. there were cities in uh, ancient America. Yeah, Stevens, Stevens uh, his books were never rare. They were published in huge editions, went through many editions, actually, um, both sets of books that he and Catherine were published. So everybody knew about the had read they were wildly popular. He was one of the most popular travel writers of all time. I mean, got reviewed by people like Edgar Allan Poe and other contemporaries. I mean, what he did was well known. And uh, both of them had been in the old these old world civilizations, knew something about them. Uh, 
Satan would have been in Egypt for quite a while. So they knew what they were talking about, and they said, this stuff is not from the old world. This is autochthonous. And the ancestors of the people who live there today, the Maya, uh, were the people who made these things. So, um, okay, so recently we've been covering uh, a discussion that, that um, the Maxwell Institute, uh, the head of the Maxwell Institute, Spencer Fuhrman, had with uh, another one of our guests. And he basically called Joseph Smith sort of a jazz artist, that Joseph Smith <laughs> would, would take kind of like a soup. He would, he would take um, cultural artifacts ideas, books, and he would synthesize them yeah. into his, what he would call revelations. Um, and it's so an amazing, it's an amazing job he did. I mean, really, I, I, I mean, it's an incredible work that he put together uh, to, to, to make this non-existent civilization sound real. Okay. And the, and if you were to sort of cast your mind back to 1826 and to what the general perceptions were about the time period, the general myths, the general prejudices, yeah. the fables, the questions. Would you think of the Book of Mormon as a book that would be produced as a sort of an amalgamation of all the rumors and myths and understandings about Native Americans at the time it was written? That's exactly what I would think. Okay. John, I got to go on. Okay, so while uh, we're gonna we're gonna give Dr. Ko a break for just a second, and we are going to um, we're going to go ahead and invite questions or comments from our listening audience. Um, Dr. Ko is going to uh, step out for just a second. Um, we want to welcome everyone who's been joining us today live. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, we have some comments that we're gonna try and. Uh, address while we're waiting for Dr. Ko. So Mark writes, so he made it all up. Um, well, Mark, that's what some people conclude. Uh, thank you for asking that question or sharing that opinion. Um, Josh writes, stop living the fairy tale life. It's a book created by man. Not one person traveled the earth with all these Bible characters and waited, waiting down each one's stories. Whoever created the Bible had a good idea to cause false hope. Thanks, Josh. I'm not sure what that has to do with this interview, but we appreciate the comment. Um, Paul's asking, could Dr. Koch comment on the claim um, of the LIDAR discovery of ubiquitous fortresses, ramparts, and defensive walls? Uh, interestingly, Dr. Koch did just show us um, some images that included uh, fortresses and defensive walls. Uh, we'll ask him when he gets back, but my sense is that there was definitely tribal warfare going on between ancient American civilizations. He confirmed that uh, to me and Travis just previously. And so, yes, there would have been all the sorts of, uh, you know, walls and fortresses and military outposts that you might expect in a, in a militaristic civilization. But we can, we can ask uh, Dr. Ko about that when he returns. Courtney writes, uh, I loved your original interview, Dr. Ko. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and talents with us. Thank you, Courtney. We're really grateful um, for that. Uh, Tim writes, my experience with academics is not good. They limit many avenues of discovery that don't fit their understanding. They are, um, there are many genuine artifacts they reject. They just call anything they don't understand frauds. Uh, okay, so Tim, we appreciate that perspective. When Dr. Ko comes back, uh, we're gonna we're gonna share with him. In fact, he's just uh, rejoining us now. So, Dr. Ko, welcome back. And we have a statement from one of our listeners that we thought we'd run by you. Uh, Tim Reese writes, "My experience with academics is not good. They limit many avenues of discovery that don't fit their understanding. Uh, there are many genuine artifacts they reject. They just call anything they don't understand frauds." How would you respond to Tim uh, as he makes an indictment of academics? <laughs> well, we're human too. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, we have our likes and dislikes and we've been uh, fooled like anybody by frauds or not fooled. Uh, actually, uh, I'm uh, 
sometimes called upon by U.S. Customs to actually decide whether things being brought in are fraudulent or not, or whether they uh, should never have been trafficked anyway. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, of course, a, 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 a problem. But uh, as far as the idea that uh, we would call something fraudulent that didn't fit in with our preconceived notions, that could happen, but I hope it hasn't happened to me. Uh, I try to keep an open mind about all these things. All right. Um, Michael Ash, we're very excited to have Michael Ash joining us as a, um, as you know, one of Fair's, Fair Mormon's arch uh, chief apologists. Michael's asking you a tough question, Dr. Coe. He's saying that Stephen's widely read books were published in 1841 and 1842, Yes. Uh, 11 to 12 years after Joseph published the Book of Mormon. Well, Joseph Smith's comments about Stevens, of course, are ex post publication. I mean, uh, when he was, this is what I understand from the, the history of all of this, that uh, uh, he decided that that's, those were the Nephite cities after he had uh, read, I suppose, the first two volumes that came out. And... Uh, uh, they could never have stimulated, uh, you know, while he was actually uh, putting the Book of Mormon together, they could never have stimulated Joseph Smith because it hadn't come out yet. But there was a lot in the air about that. I mean, there were explanations. I mean, who actually had made, uh, let's say, Cahokia or some of the mountain sites of the eastern U.S.? And uh, there was a really a a background to all of this going on among the white settlers in these areas who come in. Uh, so, uh, but, so, so and, I and think... then of course he had, he had the background of the Bible. I mean, uh, especially the Old Testament. Uh, I mean, the way he, when he, he, he wrote the, even the language used in the, in the Book of Mormon is really based upon the Bible I was raised on, which is the King James version of the Bible, down to small details, I mean, about uh, uh, how, how, he, how his narr narration took shape. Uh, it was in the language of the, of the Bible. So he was imbued with the Bible. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, descriptions of Nineveh and places of that sort in their old world cities. So he had plenty, he had plenty to base this stuff on. He didn't have to have Stevens. But oh. after Stevens came out, he said, yes. Obviously, that's, those are the Nephite cities that uh, I was being told about by the angels. Okay, uh, so, gave me this stuff. so Stevens' writing didn't influence the authorship of the Book of Mormon. No. They influenced Joseph's commentary that's exactly about, right. about the Book of Mormon art, uh, geography after Stevens published yeah. his works. Would there, been, would there have been expeditions to Central America that would have been known about prior to 1826? I doubt if... Uh, 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 Joseph Smith knew about the efforts by the Spaniards, by the Spanish king, Charles III, who was the most enlightened of all the Bourbon kings in the 18th century. He was interested in, in New World antiquities and the, as, and the Spanish dominions, and he actually had sent somebody to uh, look into Palenque, which is a famous Maya city, so-called city, and uh, Copan over in Honduras. So, uh, uh, but I doubt very much whether Stevens would have known anything about that. I mean, we've resurrected all of that stuff, by, you know, historians have, uh, from the Spanish record. But those weren't real expeditions, and uh, there were no archaeological expeditions at all at this point. And, and I guess what we're wondering is, I, I guess we know for sure that the Spanish conquistadors would have conquered Central America, Mexico, yeah. and South America. So they would have seen ruins. And so at oh, a yeah. minimum, the, the word would have gotten back to New oh, York definitely. by the early 1800s that yes. there were civilizations with ruins yeah. Yeah. all throughout Central and South America. Am I right or not? You're absolutely right. And as I say, Somebody like, I mean, the, the, the Spanish authorities in those conquered areas had to write regular reports back 
to, to first to the Council of the Indies in Seville in Spain, and then eventually to the Spanish court in Madrid uh, and uh, uh, about what's going on. But I doubt whether Smith knew about those. <laughs> I mean, he didn't read Spanish as far as I know. The, uh, and those were only published long afterwards. But they, they, they certainly did know, everybody knew about these places. Bishop Landa, who went to Yucatan uh, in the 16th century, the first bishop, he was a Franciscan bishop, and uh, he describes in uh, uh, his Relacion, uh, the relation story of the things of Yucatan, uh, a lot about Maya culture and Maya cities. But that post dated Smith, actually, at least uh, not the report, but rather the discovery of that in Spanish archives. Um, Justice Smith would not have known about that. But they, he would have known that there were such cities. Yes, that was general knowledge. Okay. So that, Michael Cole, if you have other questions, we welcome them. I hope that satisfies your response. Um, okay. So I'm going to go through this list of LIDAR findings yeah. that this author thinks bolster the validity of the Book of Mormon as a historical document. And you just comment as to whether or not you think it does that. Is that okay? Yeah. So he's saying... Um, 3 Nephi 6, 8 talks about many highways cast up and many roads made. And he's saying that LIDAR has found roads and, and highways, and so that, pro that could prove that the Book of Mormon is true. Well, I agree with the, that it, there have been highways, causeways discovered by, by LIDAR that we did not know about. That's something new. I mean, that's a good point. But... Uh, you know, if you want to interpret this as backing up, uh, you know, the Book of Mormon, that's fine. But uh, that is, part is true. Do you also just find roads and highways with advanced civilizations? Is that just sort of, do you expect roads and highways when you have towns or cities or large groups of people? Well, uh, what were roads used for uh, in, in the Maya area in the old days? I mean, the road that have been found. I mean, they're, 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 we've long known about these, these roads which go for miles and miles and miles uh, up in Yucatan, for instance. I've traveled myself, walk some of those, and they're built of, of uh, limestone, they're beautifully made, and they run straight as an arrow. There's, there's one that uh, runs uh, from a city called Yashun, a site called Yashunab, for miles and miles and miles to the to, to almost to the east coast of Yucatan, and uh, uh, what were they used for? These people had no wheeled uh, carts to haul stuff. They did not use everything that was hauled around in the Maya area for the last several thousand years was hauled on the backs of people. Uh, human chain. Same way with the rest of Mesoamerica and, and Mexico. Uh, that's not what the roads were used for. I mean, you need, you need roads like the ones in Europe or the Near East or China if you've got wheeled carts to haul stuff and people. Uh, and they never had that. It was all footwear. So what were the roads used for? And uh, we know, for instance, the ones, the causeways in Tikal, they were used ceremonially. And there were ceremonial pathways. I mean, so you're walking down the, down the, uh, the, the, the center of a church, <laughs> from one end of it, you know, entrance up to the apse at the end. They were ceremonial uh, completely. And we know from Bishop Landa, they were used that way, uh, having to do with the New Year ceremonies. Uh, each year, and they'd come to a different point in the compass, they'd have a road built to that. Each year would be in a, you know, one year would be east, the next would be north, the next would be west, the next would be south, and they would have ceremonial procession to those. He describes them very well. And uh, that's, th th they were completely ceremonial. They weren't, played, played no part in the economy, let's put it that way. And I'm just thinking, even if there were roads, 
are there civilizations without roads? Like, I don't know that Joseph Smith saying that there were roads in an ancient civilization is an act of prophecy. It's, it seems like an act of common sense. Does that make sense? Well, yes, but uh, there, are, there are roads elsewhere in the New World, in the ancient New World, that now are beginning to track some down in the Amazon uh, with LIDAR, amongst other things. And uh, we know about the Inca roads. I mean, these were some of the best roads in the world. Those were used for communication. Uh, the empire was held together by runners. Uh, it isn't that they were moving goods over them at all. Uh, they were polit for political and perhaps religious reasons only. Um, the, 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 Inca, the Inca ruler could send runners out, uh, and, you know, over, <laughs> over a thousand miles of roads to, to, to bring messages and orders uh, and report back. Uh, so, that, you know, if you're talking about comparing those to the old world roads, uh, the new world ones really were, were, were not to move goods or, or even people, okay. but for other reasons. Got it. Uh, another um, thing that the Book of Mormon mentions that the LIDAR, uh, you know, images apparently have unveiled are fortresses, ramparts, and defensive walls. So, you know, in Alma 49.13, Alma 49.18, it's talking, Alma, Alma 50, Alma 52, it's basically talking about towers and strongholds, yes. defensive walls and fortresses. Now, again, yeah. it, I kind of, the way I think about it is, any anytime there's a civilization, there's going to be warring factions they're going to have military sort of components. That's true. And as long as you have military, you're going to have fortresses and walls. So, and especially if the Old Testament had fortresses and yeah. walls and Joseph yeah. Smith's projecting the Old Testament onto the new world, that could be where he gets it. But I think what they're basically arguing is if Joseph foresaw fortresses and defensive walls and towers, yeah. that must have been an, a miraculous act of a prophecy or it's an ancient record, one of the two. Your response to that? Well, your questioner is right. They, they certainly have found, uh, I showed you some this morning on my computer that they found uh, in the Peyton in northern Guatemala. One, but it isn't everywhere. Uh, there, it, it's long been known that there was a, a, a defensible, defensible or offensive wall between Tikal and the next Great Maya Center to the north, Washington. That was discovered on the ground by people slogging through the jungle not so very long ago. But recently, from the, the LIDAR of this part of Guatemala, they have picked up a set of fortifications that nobody knew about before. Absolutely nothing. And uh, it's we can date it, uh, and it's apparently in response to uh, an invasion from Teotihuacan that I was telling you about. Uh, that's certainly something completely new. Your correspondent is right. But they're not everywhere. I mean, uh, probably every city did not have this. But there's a lot of fighting. There's, there was something like, what, 19 or 20 independent Maya kingdoms there. Small-scale stuff. And they were fighting with just about everybody else. I mean, there were allies who would fight together, and then enemies who were permanent enemy. I mean, Tikal had a, a permanent enemy in the state kingdom. Uh, it will be, you know, we're going to find more of those fortifications without any question. My archaeology went through a long period in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s saying that the Maya never, you know, went to war. They uh, were peaceful people. Well, they were like everybody else. They had their wars, plenty of them. We right. know that. Right. The, that whole model that the archaeologists built up was based on nothing. We do know that they had wars, absolutely. So if the Book of Mormon says that they had wars, that's, <laughs> that's correct. That's exactly what happened.